Question 8.1. State and explain the property of water that can help buffer changes in temperature. So I would just start off with thinking about or listing a few different properties of water. So there's strong cohesion between water molecules, which is important for producing surface tension and also for transporting water up the xylem. Water is also a metabolite in many metabolic reactions. It's a solvent in which metabolic reactions occur. It's got a high specific heat capacity, which means it buffers changes in temperature and it's got a high latent heat of vaporization, which means that it provides a cooling effect when we only lose a little bit of water through evaporation. You can see here that this question is testing your knowledge of its high specific heat capacity. So that's going to be our property. Now, what's going to be a little bit harder is explaining this. Now, the way I did my revision on water is I made a table of all the properties that you need to know about, explaining the properties and explaining the importance of those. So I'm just going to show you what I've got for this one, and that's going to help us form our answer. So high specific heat capacity, that just means that water absorbs lots of energy, lots of heat energy before its temperature changes. Now, the reason that that is, is because it's a polar molecule, which means that we get these hydrogen bonds forming between molecules. We get lots of hydrogen bonds and it's these hydrogen bonds that are able to absorb this heat energy. And most of the properties actually relate to water being a polar molecule and to the hydrogen bonds forming between molecules. So it's a good habit to get into talking about that in your answers on water if it's relevant. And I know it's not talked about in this question, but just so you understand the importance of having a high specific heat capacity in order to buffer against temperature fluctuations is it's important for bodies of water like lakes means that they make good habitat but it's also important in organisms themselves because they're mostly made up of water and that means that because the temperature doesn't change much that helps organisms maintain a constant internal body temperature particularly organisms that aren't able to regulate their own body temperature if you wanted to go even further with that you could link that to the effect of temperature on rate of reaction with enzymes so to explain that, I'm just going to put, it takes a lot of heat energy to change the temperature due to hydrogen bonding. Now, lots of students get this mixed up with high latent heat of vaporization. Vaporization is just evaporation, really. So it just means that when it evaporates, because a lot of energy has gone into it to cause it to evaporate, it provides a really good cooling effect. So we're getting one mark for stating the correct property and one mark for explaining that. And you could have talked about hydrogen bonding. So it's really important that you know all of your properties, you're able to explain all of these properties, and also that you're able to link them to their importance. Part two then about ATP. So name two products of ATP hydrolysis. So it's called adenosine triphosphate because it's got an adenine base, it's made up of a ribose molecule and it's got three phosphates. So when we talk about ATP hydrolysis, we're making ATP into ADP. That means adenosine diphosphate. Di means two, so we're basically removing one of these phosphates. And that's why we release energy from hydrolyzing ATP. So our products would be adenosine diphosphate and an inorganic phosphate. And just a side note about this as well, because I've seen it in lots of other questions, is that this releases energy, which can be used for lots of different reactions in the cell. But whenever there's a question about ATP hydrolysis and what we can use it for, it's important not to forget about the inorganic phosphate that's released too. And that's really useful and that can go on to phosphorylate other compounds and when that happens it makes them more reactive. And you'll learn about several examples of this throughout second year, for example in the respiration topic. So in the next part we've got an experiment and I'm just going to read through it as if I would read through it in an exam. So hydrolysis of ATP, that's what we've just been talking about, is catalyzed by ATP hydrolase. A student investigated the effect of ATP concentration on the activity of ATP hydrolase. So all this is really is we're doing an experiment into the effect of substrate concentration on enzyme activity. The substrate being our ATP and the enzyme being our ATP hydrolase. 
she used shortening of strips of muscle tissue caused by contraction as evidence that ATP was being hydrolyzed. So there must be some sort of link between ATP hydrolysis, probably the energy, and causing the muscle to contract. So we've got four slides and we've added strips of muscle tissue to this of the same length to each slide. So we're taking it that our muscle tissue have got our ATP hydrolyze on it. We're then adding the same volume of ATP solutions of different concentrations, so it's different concentrations to test the effect of ATP concentration to these slides and we're leaving them for five minutes and then we're looking at the length of each strip of muscle tissue and because it's gonna contract, the length is gonna shorten. So we've been given the results. So we've got these four different slides. We've got increasing concentrations and we can see that the length is decreasing. So part three, other than those given, name two variables that the student should have controlled. So we've got two things here that we need to be controlling. We need to be controlling our ATP solution and we need to be controlling our muscle tissue. So I'd say the safest bet is to do one thing for each. So because remember this is about enzymes and about enzyme activity, we can think about things that normally affect enzymes and that would be temperature and pH. So firstly, I would say we would control and keep the pH of the ATP solution the same. Or you could have said the temperature of the ATP solution and the muscle. Now, with regard to the muscle, there's lots of things we could have controlled there. We basically just want to make sure that it's the same type of muscle or it's coming from the same organism or same species. So you can put any of them. So I'm just going to say that take the muscle from the same organism. So if we look at our mark scheme here, we can see that you've got to be really specific and you've got to say that you're controlling the pH of the ATP solution. So now we want to describe and explain the pattern shown by data in table one. So describing it shouldn't be too difficult. What we can see is that as we're increasing the concentration of the ATP solution, our length of muscle tissue is decreasing. And if we're explaining that, we want to link it to what this enzyme is doing. So our ATP hydrolyze is hydrolyzing our ATP. When we hydrolyze ATP, we release energy. And it's important to say that we release energy and not that we produce energy because energy can't be created or destroyed. We're simply releasing it from another molecule. And that energy is going into the muscle contraction and causing that to happen. So we can see on our mark scheme here that the explanation part, you've really got to fully explain that. So going from linking the ATP to the energy to the muscle contraction. And our final part then of this question is a maths one. And I'm not gonna lie, this is a tricky maths question. So don't worry if you didn't manage to get the marks for this. But it's important to always have a go at maths questions, even if they do seem tricky, because quite often you can just get one or two marks, even if you don't really know what you're doing, just by playing around with the figures. So I'm gonna go through it step by step. So the hydrolysis of one decimeters cubed of a one mole per decimeter cubed solution of ATP releases 30,500 joules of energy. So I think the best way to approach maths questions is to draw it out because there's lots of numbers and stuff here and if you can visualize it, it helps make it a bit clearer. So here we've got our energy being released from this amount of ATP and 60% of this is being released as heat, which means the remaining 40% is being used for muscle contraction which gives us 12,200 joules. So now for our particular example, we've got 0.05 centimetres cubed of ATP solution to slide D. So you can see here that we actually currently don't know what the concentration of ATP is, and we want to work out the amount of energy that's available for contraction of the muscle. So that's this 40%. So if we go, if we scroll back up, we can see that in slide D, we've got eight times 10 to the power of minus six moles per decimeters cubed of ATP solution. So we can incorporate that into our workings out. But as with all biology questions, we need to pay attention to the units. So we can see in our example of how much energy we get from a certain amount of ATP, decimeters cubed is being used. Whereas in this one, centimeters cubed is being used. And so we need to be able to convert 
centimetres cubed to decimetres cubed or vice versa. So one centimetre is equal to 0.1 decimetre because centimetre means a hundredth of a metre and decimetre means a tenth of a metre. But when you're converting from a centimetre cubed to a decimetre cubed, for every extra power of one we have, we have to divide by another 10. So from here to here, we've already divided by 10 and we imagine this is to the power of one, but if we're going up two to the power of three, we basically have to add another two zeros onto that to account for that. So to convert 0 0.05 centimetres cubed into decimetres cubed, we have to divide that by a thousand. And that gives us five times 10 to the power of minus five. So if we know how much energy a decimetres cubed of this concentration of ATP gives us, we should be able to work out how much 5 times 10 to the minus 5 decimeters cubed of this smaller concentration of ATP gives us. So we just have to multiply 12,200 by 5 times 10 to the minus 5 and by 8 times 10 to the minus 6. And that should give us 4.88 times 10 to the power of minus 6. So if we look at our mark scheme, we can see that even if you got part of the way and you perhaps didn't change the units correctly, or you didn't look back on the other page and realise it was 8 times 10 to the minus 6, then you could have still got one or two marks.